Okay, I'm going to um, talk about, sort of start talking about, about uniting modeling and machine learning, but I didn't misread my, um, my section. It will come back to uh, universality and scaling in a very natural way. You'll see about midway through. Um, but one thing I want to say, I don't know the bar at the top, but it's okay, um, which relates to discussions yesterday and something David said, um, in terms of we criticize machine learning for being a black box, but it's true we're a black box too. Toddlers learn to navigate a lo local gravitational field just to walk around. Athletes make incredible calculations to hit a tennis ball or a baseball, and they couldn't possibly explain it to us what they're doing, or I couldn't explain to you what I'm doing when I walk up here to the, stodium, the podium and I walk around. And it's not just about a communication issue. I often, you know, I actually myself don't know, right? I can't tell you what I'm doing. But Newton did something great when he wrote down the law of gravity and Newton's laws, which was what Danny Bassett yesterday called open deductions. By making it an open deduction, it actually was a contribution. Nobody said toddlers and athletes already knew all of this Newton. Um, it was a contribution because it allowed us to extrapolate the same ideas to planetary or galactic orbits. Um, and it's hard to see how we get to general relativity without this, I'd argue. And, um, if we think about these phenomena, we may be, would say by analogy, they all involve motion and similar processes, but I think it's hard to show they are universal without writing down a simple version that you can really quantify and compare. And I'd argue that machine learning in its current manifestation at least is a super powerful tool, but isn't that great at helping it enough a universality or really nailing down where commonality is. And also going back to David's talk yesterday, thinking about the similarity in the mathematical form for the rules of learning or information or evolution, um, you need that simple rule to sort of say there could be some universal commonality to all that. So in terms of thinking about universality, I think machine learning, the question is how do we go from machine learning to universality is part of the question I want to ask. And that's sort of my philosophical part which people can debate, argue with me about afterwards. But now I'm going to tell sort of a specific story of research related to this. Um, which I think I said to Kristen already, I want to thank NSF because all of the work I'll show now has come about where the point where I am now through um, NSF funding, in particular career grant funded a while ago. But if we look at, you know, branching in nature, say look at trees, plants and trees, um, and ask, are these structures all the same? If we look at the branching properties, are they universal, are they not universal? Um, how do we really do that in a meaningful way? A lot of the theory for scaling and biology relates to these kind of branching structures, um, but can we really tell the difference, like by eye, like that one I had looking like a tree, and it is a tree, but it's the tree of a mouse lung. It's the vascular network in a mouse lung. It's not a tree growing outside. Um, and if we want to do more than just distinguish plants and our vascular networks inside our body, um, can we tell different organ types, like a liver from a lung from the brain, or can we tell disease states like cancer or stroke recovery? Um, could we do that from branching properties and learn something about mechanism from that? And just to say right now, this is an article that came out, I guess, two years ago that was a big sort of review perspective called the Radiomics Paradigm, which is the idea of using machine learning and medical imaging to actually take um, images of vascular networks and other things as well, but vascular networks is a big one, and apply machine learning to see if we can separate diseases or aggressive tumors from non-aggressive tumors, things like that. So that's a big application that really is the same question. Can we tell the differences from branching structures of these different, different things we see? Um, and here on the right, this starts the medical imaging part. One of the big things is just to get out the data in the first place. Um, and this is software we wrote to get out the data because there's huge amounts of medical data, a lot of um, latent data inside of it that hasn't been gotten out. So getting that data out was a big first step. But what I'm going to talk about now is if we have that data in 20 minutes or an hour, I can get, for an individual, I can get their, you know, whole image vascular network, not for the whole body, but for a region. Um, if I plot this out for plants and mammals in different parts, can I see any patterns? Here, obviously I do, um, but this is cheating in a way. It's just the fact that I have a big tree and a small mouse. Um, so I can tell the difference based on size if I just plot a measure of diameters and lengths of vessels, but I am saying it's cheating because I went out and measured an elephant that was similar in size to the tree vessels or a small shrub that was similar in size to the mouse, I wouldn't be able to use that fact, right? So I don't need 
machine learning. Again, a toddler could tell me these are different, but they're different in a very trivial way. But if I try to make them all be standardized, so I take, say, the biggest one way to do it, and I think that's what's in this picture, is take like the largest vessel and standardize everything relative to the largest vessel, and I plot lengths versus diameters, I get clouds of mammals and clouds of plants that overlap. It looks like kind of a mess, and I don't see clear groups that distinguish them at all. And if you apply machine learning to this, it's hard to get much boundary between them. Like classic problem machine learning is classification. It's hard to see much classification based on this picture. So I could just throw up my hands and say, it doesn't work. Machine learning is not going to solve this problem. Or I could say, well, we actually know something about vessel networks. Um, and a lot of that's due to lots of people historically. But in this context of scaling universality, which is where scaling universality come back in, due to Jeffrey, Brian, and subsequent work by a lot of us, um, where we do know some things about the vascular networks, right? One is that they're branching and hierarchical. The way in which they're connected really matters in terms of how radius and length change as you go down through that network. And one of the properties of this, which Jeffrey mentioned, is this idea of self-similarity, at least approximate self-similarity, which relates to power laws and scaling, that this same sort of process is repeat process, and in this case, just literally geometry, the radius and length of vessels, the ratio between them at this level is the same as the ratios at this level. So if I blow up a picture, I can't tell the difference. If I look at coastlines or leaves, and I blow up parts of the leaf, it looks like the bigger leaf. So the same structure is repeated over and over again across scales. And that has a lot of information in it, not just about the raw data for radius and length, but actually connections between radius and length, which isn't in here at all, right? This has nothing to do, just because I have a diameter vessel here and here, I have no information about how they're related, right? There's no connect, at the minimum, there's no connectivity in here at all. Um, we also can characterize these self-similarity relationships by literally just looking at the radius of a vessel relative to its parent vessel, or the ratio of the length of a vessel relative to its parent vessel. And we can characterize these in terms of scaling ratios, betas and gammas, which is what's done in the theory. And the betas, you can get predictions under the simplest version, like symmetric branch here, say more in a second, from energy minimization, which Jeff talked about, eliminating reflections of um, pulsatile waves in large vessels and um, minimizing dissipation or friction in vessels for small vessels. And you can get simple relationships for what these betas and gammas should look like, which really is just a simple rule for how the radius of the vessel should change as you branch down through the network, and proportionally how parent and child vessels should match. And similarly, if you look at space filling properties, like basically that the whole cardiovascular network can't just be a big lump in the middle of our body, it has to spread out through our entire body and get a capillary close enough to every cell at a small scale, um, you can get a relationship for how the lengths change throughout the network, the proportional changes in lengths as you go down from big to small vessels. That's what Jeffrey and Brian and Jim, who was mentioned, um, did. Um, there's a huge contribution, and this is the same idea, but it, this is recognizing that it's not just symmetric branching. You can have asymmetric branching where two ch children or daughter vessels have different sizes or radii. And it's a way to sort of have betas and gammas, but also take into account their deviations as well. I'm not going to go into it, but basically it's like just a generalized version to account for asymmetries and betas and gammas. And you can write down, you still can write down things like how do we ener minimize energy and area conservation in terms of this beta bar and delta beta. So you have two parameters now instead of just one beta, but you can still write down relationships for how these scaling relationships, scaling ratios satisfy energy minimization or space filling. Um, and if you do that, and you do this scaling ratio for radii here, and the sort of difference factor, which is this deviation or asymmetry here, and I do machine learning, then I actually can get some reasonable results. I mean, not perfect, but you know, there are exceptions for reasonable results where mammals show up here, plants show up actually in various places, which I'll say more about in a second. Um, and this dashed line is sort of energy minimization, which you see two groups of plants fall on. But then the mammals and these other plants deviate in different directions from it. And in that case, I want to say that gets to one thing Jen raised, which is the idea that universality is useful for finding commonality, but it's also useful for finding um, deviations. It's a way to set a baseline to understand what the deviations mean from the commonality or the universality. Um, and I also wanted to point out 
that it's not saying these betas and these delta betas have the exact same value because they don't. It's that they satisfy a universal principle or constraint relationship, right? The constraint or the principle is the same, but not the actual values. There's a range of values you can have. And you can break this down to say, well, given the plot that I just showed, what do the actual branching architectures look like for those regions I showed you? How does that look for the mammals? Um, you can try to make, like, make comparisons like gymnosperm to angiosperm, and you can see actually some separations there. So you can be more fine-grained about this, which I'm not also not going to go into, but you can be more fine-grained about how this works and how the deviations work. Another interesting fact is if I look at um, length average scale factor versus length different scale factor, the same thing but instead of for radii for length, so this would be the space-filling kind of constraint. I actually get these big clouds for mammals and plants, and if I put them on top of each other, they largely overlap, and I can't tell much difference again. So from the radius information, I actually, as long as I include the scaling ratios, I can distinguish, but from length, I can't. There are two ways you can interpret that. One is that maybe space filling isn't a distinguishing factor between branching networks. Maybe they all do it similarly. Or another is that, and I would say from other analysis I'm not showing here, that actually there's more to the space filling picture than I've told you. That the, even including this generalized theory for radius, the same sort of equations match up. But space filling, maybe the general principle or universal principles we apply have to change a little bit. Not the concept, but the actual mathematical equation version is different than what was originally written down. So I said all this for sort of trees and blood vessel networks. But we're also getting into looking at neural networks as well. We have these, this is not a great picture, but <laughs> I had this movie, but I, it's too big to put on here, um, where there's incredible imaging happening now of neurons and their connections. So you can also ask comparisons of those to each other or just different neuron sets or different either types of neurons or connections in the brain. So there's lots of potential applications um, to look at branching properties of networks and try to think about them in terms of these universal principles um, and combine machine learning and modeling to go back and forth to, to learn new things. Um, so again, I'll say you need for machine learning and modeling. Here I said that the reason we need sort of modeling is because the choice of what measurements and data you have is crucial. It's not just radius and length. Connectivity matters. If you put in connectivity, even without telling it universal rules, if you tell it connectivity, that helps some. Um, and there's lots of choices of what data to include. The choice of feature space is crucial. It's not always that raw data is the best thing to look at. I mean, you want it to learn these rules if possible, but actually looking at these ratios or logs can help. Um, it's not just more data is better, it must be thoughtful. And like for these neural images that we're getting, they're enormous images. They're so big, it's, you just can't handle it reasonably with like lots of different comparisons. So you have to find some way to reduce the data. Um, and yeah, it's not as simple as starting with all data or even the whole image for a lot of these cases. Here are people um, who in various ways have contributed to this work at all levels. Um, and again, that's a lot of things to, to the NSF. The NSF has helped support a lot of people through this. Um, and actually, I'll leave there. But yeah, thanks to NSF for enabling all these people to work on this. And I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> General comment, I just want to, because I've been listening since yesterday and today continuing the same thing. Um, I just want to quote Bob Laughlin, uh, who about maybe six years ago at our first meeting on the Brain Initiative uh, said one thing. At that time, everybody was talking about collecting data and classifying it and brain networks and trillions of neurons and this and that, then dendrites, axons. And he said one thing that actually Terry Sienowski said he, this was the smartest comment during the whole five-day meeting. If we understand how these things are built uh, developmentally, we actually understand these networks. Right now we are trying to classify them as they're already built. But I didn't hear anybody actually talking how things are being built. That's a great question, and I didn't talk about it at all, you're right. But I'm often really curious how these things are built and what constraints that places on it. Because when we say energy immunization or space filling, that's sort of given, it's actually the, the um, maximizing out of the possible 
not necessarily the actual, because the growth itself may really constrain what you can get to. And so I've looked at that a little bit in other work, and I think it does make a difference. And I think the question is, I, what I want is, like, it'd be great to have a good data set to, like, look at the growth as it happens in these networks, and that hasn't been that available, although maybe through zebrafish or other things we can get to better data like that for the vessel systems. But I think that's a great question. I think it does make a difference. I think theoretically we can begin to explore it. And empirically, I don't, I don't have great data yet, but I'd love to see great data on that. The, develop, the growth process matters a lot. Yeah. 